LSD and pretended to be French for 10 months. About 11 months ago I moved into a new house as a temporary sort of thing until I could get the money together to sort something out properly, I was hoping to have already moved out by this point. On my second day after I'd finished unpacking I decided to break the house in with a nice acid trip. I'd brought some with me that I'd recently bought but hadn't had the chance to use yet. Things were going well with the trip but then it seemed to be getting really intense and I quickly realized that the tabs were much stronger than I had been told they were, and I thought being locked up in the unfamiliar house wasn't helping me relax. So I figured the best thing to do to relax would be to go for a stroll because I was starting to get pretty overwhelmed at that point. So I left the house to start my walk and my next door neighbor happened to be just arriving at the same time. It's a street of tightly packed terraced houses so next door's door is about one meter away from mine. I'd not met anybody on my street yet and didn't realize this was a friendly tight-knit community where people talk to each other. She said something along the lines of hello nice to meet you, my name's, her name, are you new to the area? So basically I do this thing sometimes when people try to sell me things on the street etc where I pretend I can't speak English. I remember a few words from my GCSE French so I just say some nonsense sentences and then people usually leave me alone. In the state I was in this conversation seemed like it would be way too intense for me and French just sort of came to me as my default response to the situation. My exact words were Je voudrais une boulangerie, one of my favorite lines to use, and I shrugged my shoulders a bit with a weak smile. She pretty much just left me to it after that and I got on my way. I did my walk and got home about 2 hours later, I was tripping majorly so the walk ended up taking a lot longer than it needed to. When I got home though, my next door neighbor was standing in her doorway talking to another neighbor who was standing outside. I tried to keep my head down because I couldn't handle any more human interaction but she waved at me and said bonjour, so I instinctively returned the bonjour and got inside my house as fast as possible. When I got in I started freaking out straight away because I realized that I'd just become French and now two of the neighbors think I can't speak any English. The next day when I woke up I realized the best thing I could do, as an Englishman, was just live with the lie for the rest of my short stay in this house to avoid the excruciating embarrassment of having pretended to be French for seemingly no reason. Fast forward 10 months, I still live here, and at this point I'm in deep. My life on this street is a web of lies. I've perfected my French accent and over the course of 10 months French me has learned a decent amount of English so he can hold a disjointed conversation. I'd gotten to know the neighbors pretty well and I was the nice quirky French guy on the street. I didn't let the lie slip ever, because every day in every conversation I had just meant that it would be even worse if anyone ever discovered I wasn't French. If I had friends come over, I don't have many so it wasn't too bad, they would never speak to the neighbors because of my strange situation. Most of them found it amusing, at least. Things were going okay and I wasn't too worried about being exposed anymore because I'd gotten so used to it. I'm not home that much and when I am I rarely leave the house for any reason so I only had to do it for maybe 5 minutes a day when I was out on my street. If anything it was a nice way to spice up my day when I got to take on my French persona. French me somehow had much better social skills than the real me, even if his English was a bit limited. But then there was the day it all came crashing down. I was walking to my car and saw one of the neighbors coming towards me from the opposite direction with someone else next to her I didn't recognize. She stopped to say hi, as she normally does, and then she said to her friend this is F7TJ78, the guy I was telling you about. You might be able to see where this is going. Her friend hit me with a question in French that I didn't understand a word of, and I knew he was actually French straight away because his accent was way better than mine. I didn't know what to do and I just froze. Every second that went past just made it so much more painful and after way too long of a pause I just decided I had to come clean. I told her I wasn't actually French and couldn't speak French and then I tried to play it off like some kind of practical joke I've been doing on everyone. Nobody was buying that. I fast walked straight to my car and then let the embarrassment just swallow me for a while. I haven't spoken to any of my neighbors since, some of which I'd struck up a friendly relationship with over those 10 months. I make sure nobody is around now whenever I leave the house, and I do a loop around the block in my car if any of my neighbors are walking down the street when I get home so that I never come into contact with them. Every time I think about the day I was discovered the embarrassment physically hurts me. What is the most memorable interaction you had with a customer? He wasn't completely hammered, but I'll share my favorite interaction I've had with a bar guest, that honestly was a huge eye-opener to how to live my own life instead. The restaurant slash bar I work at is an odd concept, we have a lot of different things going on throughout the week, so some nights it goes from a nice place to grab food and drinks for dinner, to straight up dance club slash high volume bar. I love it because it's just a glorious, well executed, and managed crap show, so walking it always keeps me on my toes, anyways getting off topic. We do trivia on Sunday and Monday nights and our table taps, big tubes of beer that sit on the table or bar so everyone can pour their own beer, are half priced all night. So we were a fairly new establishment and we were still getting a lot of new people in to see what all the fuss was about. This guy comes in and he's probably late 40s, normal looking guy, my first thought was he looks like a friend of mine's dad. I'm fairly observant and noticed his hands look like those belonging to someone who was in construction, or some sort of manual labor type profession. Nothing wrong with physical labor. I've done the work myself, I just sort of scan people naturally and harmlessly in my head, put them into a certain stereotype and then try to see if it holds up. I love it when the negative stereotypes don't hold up. I had been trying to work on not being so judgy, which I could have been like this guy's probably gonna be a typical sort of construction guy whatever. 
I told him about the special and that it actually comes out cheaper to buy the beer tower at half price than drink three of the large beers. He wasn't overly grumpy or snarky, just very short with his answers. Just seemed like he didn't want to talk much. If you want to listen I'll talk that's for sure. So I talked him into the tower, he watched whatever sports games were on the TVs, drank some beer, and ate some food. Eventually he loosens up and gets to talking about how he just moved back in the area in the last few months after living in New Orleans for 25 years. As we're talking about New Orleans, a classic rock song, might have been Led Zeppelin, they're one of my favorites so we'll say Ramble on came on and I said ooh. This is a great song. So we start talking about music and he mentions he lived right outside of some fairgrounds in New Orleans and he, his wife and daughter would walk down the street to concerts that would come through, Widespread Panic was one band he mentioned that stood out and sort of bonded us because I had just seen them at Hangout Fest in Gulf Shores not long before this night, and we both liked some of the same bands. Throughout our conversation he would sort of randomly mention, well yeah my daughter's normally with me during this time, but she's in college now and down in Florida on spring break. Which I mistook for a dad missing his daughter, who is now growing up, and the beers sort of bring that emotional side out. Finishing our music conversation, he pays out after he's been at the bar for about 3 hours, our convo was sort of off and on as I went back and forth to other guests. He gets up and asks which way to the restroom. As he comes back from the other room and by my bar, I'll never forget it as long as I live, I'm not just saying that, but the events of our seemingly normal encounter got burned in my brain, he stops and sort of lends up to the bar and looks me in the eye and says hey man, I'm sorry if I was a butthole when I came in earlier, and I told him he didn't come across that way, guess he realized how short and sort of unapproachable he was being at first, and the brewskis brought out that apology, and he said well, thank you for still talking to me, it's been a rough day because this is the first year my daughter hasn't been with me today, and it's the 4 year anniversary of my wife of 30 years passing away, so thank you for not just dismissing me. He reached his hand out to shake mine, and told me to have a good night and walked out the door. I'm a fairly emotional guy, not in a dramatic way, or anything, just very empathetic and I had recently lost my grandmother with whom I was very close. So I got teary eyed, had someone watch my bar, and go outside to smoke a cigarette and settle down, and it's still an encounter I think of almost every day. Those minutes after that just thinking by myself were so profound. Why did you and your first significant other break up? Around 14 me and a few of the guys I went to school with started hanging around with these girls from another school on the other side of the city. We hung out a lot, all friends, then the other guys started dating some of the girls and in an effort to not make me feel left out, I wasn't interested in dating at the time I was quite happy playing football and chilling out, so they brought their other friend. We'll call her Maria. Anyway, Maria and I are talking. We have very little in common. I like sports and music. She likes to do very little and read. I should point out here. Maria was absolutely stunning. At the time a solid 10 whereas I sat somewhere around a 5 pushing a 6. All good. This goes on for a few weeks. I like her. She's funny, gorgeous and I was quite happy, basically sitting looking at her. This all takes place during summer holidays, anyway school comes around me one of my best friends are sat in our electronics class, we picked it for our GCSEs and we were starting our projects that week, and he says I bet you 20 pounds and a packet of whatever it is you're smoking that you can't make you and Maria official. I took it as a joke and said yeah whatever man you're on. So for the next few weeks we were getting on well. We started meeting up earlier than the others and going hanging out on our own. By this point she'd found out that I liked her. But guys being guys my friends never mentioned if it was mutual. We had each other's phone numbers as well and would text all the time. This was back in 2004. We didn't have WhatsApp or iMessage. Etc we had 10p texts and a pay as you go phone. Anyway, fast forward about 3 more weeks. We've sort of fallen into being a couple. We've not told anyone as we're kinda just confused about it as well. She asks if I think we're a couple. I said it's up to you. I'm happy either way. She says yeah let's make it official. So back in those days. You had MSN Messenger and MySpace. So to make it official it was a top friend on MySpace and a name drop in your MSN name. That happened. The friend that made the bet with me instantly messages me saying bullcrap. You've told her and she's going along with it. I asked what he was about. He says the bet we made. I said I thought that crap was a joke and men were just gonna see what happened. Anyway the next time I see him he pays up even though I said I thought he was joking. A year or so later. Me and my mates are stressed as all hell. GCSEs are getting us down. We're starting to worry about college etc so electronics class happens again. I'm nearly done with my project, a laser tripped home security system made for under 20 pounds, he's finishing up his road safety thing. And knocked my project off the table while I was going picking some more parts out of my tray of components I'd ordered. I get back to the desk and my craps in pieces on the floor. I go metal. It took Kyle about 6 months to design, sim, order parts and build to a point where it would work. I punched him for it. He knew how hard I'd worked on it. After A, at the time I thought this, well deserved beating. He says he's going to tell Maria about the bet. He proceeds to do so. The next time I saw her. She gave me a slap says so this year was nothing but a bet between you and your mates. You're a jerk. His girlfriend splits up with him because he split me and Maria up and she thought I was a nice guy and he'd messed my electronics course up entirely. Few months later me and Maria bump into each other out and about. 
I'm off to band practice. She's going to the library next to the practice rooms. After we'd done our respective activities for the day we met for a milkshake, had a chat and tried again. Five months later we split again. For unrelated reasons I just wasn't into it anymore. Fun times. What was the worst reason someone gave for breaking up with you? About six years ago, I lived in an extremely tiny town. Nobody locked their doors or cars, or anything of that sort. Everyone knew each other and it was a very tight-knit community. For reference, I am 25 years old, 6 feet 4 inches, 260 pounds around 10% body fat. I have an IFBB Pro card in bodybuilding, this will come into play later in the story. So my wife and my dog are sleeping in our bedroom which is on the opposite side of our apartment, with the door closed, so the dog doesn't rumble through the garbage at night while we sleep. It's raining outside and usually the apartment creaks and makes noises because it's very old, but I ignore it and go back to sleep as it happens every night. Now this night in particular I was hearing some, extra noises. My dog who usually ignores the sounds as well was going absolutely bonkers in the room. He's not a barker, but he lets me know when he hears something by jumping on the bed and licking my face, also when he's scared. So to get back to the story, my dog is going nuts, my wife is sound asleep, and I am up watching Netflix at around 3am when I have work at 8am. I keep hearing these faint noises, like a cabinet opening and closing, but like I said before, we are in a very small community and I think nothing of it, no way someone is actually in my apartment. So all of a sudden I take one earphone out, and I hear it the flicker of a light switch. It's an old house so it has those loud light switch flicker when you turn something on and off. I imminently knew something was wrong as this is not a sound I normally hear, and I get up and creak my door open just a little and see a light on in the near kitchen room. I know I shut all the lights before showering before bed, so I leap into action, wake up my wife and tell her to stay here with the dog and lock the door and to not come out unless I say everything is safe. I walk into the kitchen and there is a guy, probably late 30s, going through every drawer and cabinet I had. I said hey in a loud voice and scared the absolute crap out of the guy, I guess he thought no one was home, and he charged at me. So for reference remember I said. 6 4 260ths of a pounds, and the guy charging at me, around 5 feet 10 inches slash 160? So he charges at me and I shove him against my wall with my forearm against his neck, make a huge hole in the wall, and begin to headbutt the guy until he's nearly unconscious. I turned him around and proceeded to hold him in a choke hold headlock and out of nowhere his wife, I later found out it was his wife, was also in my apartment and came charging at me. I put up my foot, exactly how you would imagine it in the WWE, and I punted that goober right in her gut, and she fell to the floor. So now, the guy is unconscious, the girl is on the floor in massive amounts of pain, and I'm standing there covered in blood from this guy's face. I feel funny, not sure what this feeling is. I feel cold in a spot on my stomach, sort of like if you spit on your stomach and a strong gust of wind comes and it feels extra cold, you know what I mean? Well, I looked down and realized I got stabbed. I had a 4.5 inch knife in my clear abdomen muscle. While I was headbutting this guy, he was able to sneak a knife he had right into my gut, without me realizing it. I quickly start to panic and call 911. I sit there until they come, go to the hospital, nearly dying. I recovered well, missing all vital organs, and when I woke up in the hospital I had police there and was told that the guy robbing my apartment was dead. My headbutts broke his skull and he internally bled out in his brain. My heart sank. Yes the guy stabbed me, yes the guy threatened my wife and dog, who is like my son, and yes he came onto my property, but I did not want to end anyone, well anyway, to sum up the story, when I awoke in the hospital and they told me this, my wife divorced me on the spot saying she can't stay married to someone who ends someone else, regardless of the situation. What reason did you break up with your BF slash GF for that they will never know about? I watched him cheat on me and he will never know. We lived in the same city and had been dating for about 10 months, the last couple of months his passive aggressive manipulations had begun to come a bit more transparent, but I was young, and convinced I could fix everything. On a Friday when we had plans, he called to say a friend at work had been fired, and he was going to go out with him to help cheer him up. It was fine, I said, and he hung up before I could finish my sentence that I had left some work papers at his place the night before and needed to grab them. I had keys so I didn't think anything of swinging by after dinner and drinks with my brother to let myself in to grab them. As expected he and his two best friends slash roommates were out. What was not expected was when I was in a little office adjoining his bedroom gathering my papers, the apartment door opened and a lot of giggling ensued. I kept quiet as I assumed one of his friends was getting lucky and I didn't want to interrupt. Imagine my surprise when the giggling and intoxicated slurring approached the bedroom I usually occupied, followed by the squeaking bed springs and a symphony of noises usually associated with mating pigs. Any hope I might have had that it was one of his roommates too intoxicated to find his own room was dashed when she started yelling his name. As they were both clearly schnoozled, it didn't take long for them to pass out mid-thrust. I managed to unfreeze myself and after spending several very sad moments looking at the irrefutable proof that this relationship was not worth saving, I slipped out the front door. I spent all night walking the city, at first feeling ashamed that he had cheated on me, then increasingly more angry that I felt ashamed, then finally angry at him. By the time morning arrived, I had decided how best to deal with the situation. I walked back to his building and called him when he picked up, clearly mostly asleep, I told him we needed to talk and I would be up in 5 minutes, and hung up, smiling for the first time as I imagined his panic. 
Five minutes later, sitting in his living room, I simply said I felt we weren't working out, that I was not as happy as I suspected I could be, and that while our relationship used to be exciting, it was feeling more like a chore. I wished him the best and was walking out the door before he managed to pick his jaw off the floor. On a hunch, I went out the back door and was pleased, if not surprised, to find his half-dressed companion crouching out on the fire escape. What followed was weeks of pleading, denial and desperation on his part. When I was unyielding, he began to be suspicious. Did I know about his indiscretion? He of course, couldn't ask me, in case I didn't know, so he started lashing out at all of his friends and co-workers who had been there that night, accusing them of telling me. And in this manner, they all learned of his infidelity. It caused, I later found, some major rifts between him and his friends, as they all liked me, and led to him being let go at work for increasingly erratic behavior and causing hostility with his co-workers. Parents have read it, why are you disappointed in your adult child? I just disowned my stepson last week. He came into my life at 12, a few months short of turning 13. He turned 23 a couple of months ago. It's been 10 years of hell. I missed my children, divorce sucks and I didn't see them enough, and really looked forward to him being my son. I knew from the moment he moved in that he was lying to me about virtually everything. No matter how big or small, he would deflect outright lies. He started getting bad grades in school, claiming I don't want to be a nerd. We worked with him. He'd get straight A's for 6 weeks, then purposefully start failing again. Then he got involved with the less desirable elements, older than him as well. He started fighting. A lot. Became his group's enforcer. At 15 he got locked up in a juvenile detention center with a boot camp like program for 6 weeks. Model citizen. Perfect grades. Respectful. The instructors told us that they had no idea why he was even there. Came home 3 days before his 16th birthday. Perfect gentleman. On his birthday he went out with friends and disappeared for days. Came back, had obviously been using something, got in a fight with his mother, left. Came back, kicked in the back door and stole some electronics. We called the cops and they had him in 30 minutes, on his way to the pawn shop. In court the next day, he was rude and belligerent. Did 6 months in real juvie this time. Came home after Christmas. Back to school. Back to fighting. Finally got jumped by 3 guys with brass knuckles that put him in the hospital. Finally quit fighting. Dropped out of HS at 17. Got married a few months later, my wife is an idiot for supporting it. Gets her pregnant, they split up a few months in. Cue the cycle of him arguing with his mother, being hateful and nasty to her and leaving. Weeks or months go by, he comes back. Over the course of the last 6 years there have been girlfriends living with us because my wife cannot say no to her little boy. He won't hold a job. Best streak of working is about 2 months. Meanwhile he's been locked up multiple times for substances, being in a burglary ring, domestic violence, driving without a license, failure to pay child support, did I mention that there are two kids by different mothers now? The latest is a return of one of the psycho girlfriends that I have explicitly banned from our property. That's crazy. Turns out a few weeks back they inform that she's pregnant. At the same time I warn her that the more she lets them hang out while I'm away, the better the chance that something bad happens. It did. He had one of his flare-ups one evening late. I'm out of town. He's stone cold sober gets pissed off at nothing, really, I reviewed the security footage. Proceeds to get into an argument with his mother. Screaming in the front yard. It moves over by the garage. Grabbed her and threw her down on the driveway. Landed on the corner of the concrete on her tailbone. Couldn't get up. Spent most of the night in the hospital. I drove in from two hours away in the middle of the night. She's okay, but it could have been much worse. This is one more in a long string of events that culminated in physical violence for the first time. I didn't mince words. Never again. Disowned. She has agreed. Somehow I don't think it will last and that makes me sad. I have been clear though, from here out she can pick one of us. Him or me. What is the deepest, darkest secret you found out about a friend that really messed with your head? When I was around 8 years old I met a girl named Molly. Her family had moved in that summer to a house a few houses down and I really didn't see her for the first month or two that summer. My first memory of her was when I was playing with a small anthill in my backyard and she came over and joined me. She showed interest in my anthill and by 8 year old logic she was the coolest person ever and we became best friends. We would play every day that we could in her backyard or my backyard, go to the pool, ride bikes, ride scooters, and play basketball. Basically if I went outside she would be out with me. A few years later we were still best friends and did everything together. When we were about 12-13ish I remember it was the late fall of 7th grade when she didn't show up for a month of school. When she came back she didn't really tell me why she was gone she said that she was sick and was taking medication to get better so I never thought too much about it after. We would still hang out every day but I started to notice that she wasn't the same. She wasn't as hyper as she always was like she would have to take breaks more often when we were doing stuff. The summer before 8th grade and 8th grade she still seemed pretty normal but I remember that her mom would call her in to take medication and she could stay out as long with me anymore. High school started. We went to the same high school but didn't get to hang out as much because I was playing baseball and she started to take up playing the piano. She used to play softball slash baseball with me until she said she had to stop playing baseball so she took up an instrument. 
Because of our different schedules we didn't get to see each other too often and we would once or twice a week but it felt like we never talked. In the summer after freshman year we used to hang out every day and but she couldn't go out as much she would be inside her house more and I would go over to her place and watch TV, play video games and she got really good with the piano so she would play when my family would go over for barbecues. This summer was also the same summer she was going to the doctors more often she would always tell me it was just a checkup and if she didn't say checkup she would say she was getting testing done. She would tell me that she was okay but I knew something wasn't okay. Our family shared a beach house down in South Carolina that we would go to in August of each summer. About the second week of being there that's when I found out. We would go out to the boardwalk pretty much every morning before it go too hot and just go to the beach get ice cream cones every day and do whatever this was the first summer that her dad had to come with us everywhere and it wasn't really a big deal neither one of us really minded but I didn't know why he wanted to come. We were standing in line to get food when I saw her pass out in the middle of ordering food for everyone. I was freaking out while her dad called her mom to meet them back at the house because Molly passed out. So he picked her up and we ran back to the house which was about 5 minutes away and just got in their car and started speeding towards the local hospital. Her parents took her to emergency care and I waited in the waiting room. I called my parents and told them what happened and they met me at the hospital. About 6 hours later I was allowed to see her and she told me that she was okay and that she must have passed out from the heat and not drinking enough water. She was staying at the hospital overnight so she and my parents took me out to eat and stopped by the house first to get changed and stuff before heading back to the hospital. I had just finished showering and getting changed when her mom stopped by my room and told me that she and parents had to talk to me. This was the scariest moment of my life. Her parents had told me that Molly was diagnosed with ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, back in the 7th grade and that she wasn't expected to live much longer. Her condition was getting worse and she might only live for a few more years. I didn't know what ALS was so they were explaining it me and I remember crying for an hours. I went back to the hospital with her parents to check up on her and get her food and then we went to her room and they told her that they told me what was happening. She was literally a year or two from death but she didn't cry or feel sorry for herself. She had just passed out and was smiling and joking about saying she wasn't going to have to do her summer projects and homework at least and was comforting her parents and I. She was the most amazing person I have ever met to be able to be that happy and confident in the face of death. She ended up coming back to school that fall with me and she told our small circle of friends what might happen to her in the coming year and how she wanted it to be the best year. It was the most bittersweet moment of my life. All my friends and I quit sports and after school clubs so we could hang out with her every day. And we all just did whatever she wanted. Any place she wanted to go anything she wanted to do. My parents would even let me sleep over at her house whenever we wanted and I basically ended up living with her for the entire sophomore year of high school. That was the most fun year of my life and I won't forget it. That summer her condition worsened. And on August 17th she passed away. She was the prettiest, smartest, funniest, most confident, outgoing, energetic, friendliest and loving person I will ever know. People with traumatic childhoods, what are the effects the trauma had on your adult life? I had it okay, but having an alcoholic dad, still trying to forgive, we're working on it, for sure did a few things to my personality, I'm very quick to get defensive. I can feel it in my chest. Critiques or comments about small, innocuous things can put me in survival mode, partly because, I think, I spent so much time in survival mode justifying anything I was currently doing, that I have difficulty getting out of it. I hate having to justify myself, but I tend to over explain everything to get out ahead of the argument I assume is coming. Typing that out just made me realize I'm very often trying to get out ahead of an argument before one even starts. I remember when I was in high school, my dad came screaming into my room that I was napping too much and that I was on some crappy substances. Admit it. In reality, I had a 6am weight training class I felt like I needed to take because then maybe I wouldn't be as much of a target for him, and my only time of relative peace was late at night after everyone was asleep, so I slept like 5 hours, went to school, then came home and napped for an hour before I had to go to work until midnight. Things that aren't really attacks feel like attacks, because that's how it would always start, passive aggressive comment, then full blown explosion later if a couple of comments didn't work. I can read the emotional state of a room. I'm always looking and noticing how people are feeling. It is not out of altruism, but out of habit. Had to get good at it. Kept anger and comments away from my brother. I'm almost 100% in the ballpark. I can't read minds, but I notice if someone feeling pissy slash annoyed very early. Or if there's some tension. I need absolute quiet to sleep. People slash noises in the middle of the night immediately bring me from 0 to 11. I need to know what the noise is, what is going on, who is where. I don't find any difficulty in cutting people out of my life, and that one is concerning. I feel like a normal response to that would be to at least grieve a bit, but it's just so matter of fact with my thoughts. Okay, they are gone forever now. I don't talk to them. Moving on. Overthinking and overplanning after one argument, okay, that person is gone now, we had an argument. They hate me forever, so let's plan on how to never see them again. When someone in the room is angry, anxiety goes through the roof. Heart rate goes to the moon. Must fix. Can't let the anger get worse. Do whatever you can to appease, now. It's going to be very bad if you don't fix their anger. I tend to keep my interests to myself, and only share them if I'm certain the other party is also interested in the same things.
everything my dad didn't already like, music, any sport I played that he never did, hobbies he wasn't interested in, was deemed stupid, dumb, waste of time, crappy, how could you call that crap music, etc. So I just stopped advertising what I thought was cool. I still tailor playlists slash movies slash activities slash etc. to the people I will be around, I think in a subconscious effort to avoid setting anyone off. Difficulty saying no and people pleasing. Especially in my career. One that I really need to keep working on is how I've somehow internalized certain insults and tossed them about casually. Especially on the internet, I hate how I go from normal disagreement to you mouth breathing dip crap, you are the dumbest mother ducker alive. Quick to anger. I hate being told I'm wrong, much more than the average person. Growing up, no matter what evidence or what have you I had, I was wrong. And sometimes, guess what, I am wrong, but when I'm in an argument or a disagreement, it brings me right back to when my dad would be clearly waiting for me to stop talking so he could yell at me until I shrunk back down and I feel like I have to die on whatever hill I am currently on or it's all over, I'm never going to get people to listen to me ever again. I'm really trying to work on this, but my knee-jerk reaction is you're not listening to me. I'm right back to being a kid trying to explain how I couldn't have broken the goddamn plugins on the back of the TV, just admit it goddamn it because I was at school all day. One response only to yelling slash tense arguments slash etc. Shut down completely and stop talking while stewing in anger. How did you stupidly make your medical condition worse? It was Valentine's Day and I was sick. Fever, chills, fatigue, nausea, and general misery had kept me home for the day. I'm in the medical field myself and it seemed that the entire region was currently decimated by this year's influenza strain, so no biggie dot that weird twinge in my side that started a few days ago was probably a pulled muscle from too many back stretches at the dance studio, right? I had shrugged it off, but now it legitimately hurt with every step I took. Ugh, fine, I'll go to the stupid clinic today, but later, first I need some more sleep, I woke up with barely enough time to fling myself out of bed and towards the hall bath, getting there just in time to vomit more fluids than I thought I'd consumed. Also, I noticed the lack of the coughing or congestion that typically arrives with the flu, so maybe there's something else going on. That pain is right over my left kidney, but it's probably nothing. Okay, then, I should probably get my pukey butt to the nearest urgent care clinic, and I definitely shouldn't be driving. I called husband and explained the current circumstances, asking him to come home and take me to the doctors. Because I'm a stubborn paramedic who hates it when people go directly to the hospital's emergency room for ridiculously minor things, I went to an urgent care clinic near my house. I expected to have a PA confirm my self-diagnosis and tell me to tough it out with Flonase and Mucinex, because treating a virus like influenza usually means managing the symptoms and trying to decrease the discomfort. The PA took a quick look at me and told me to go to the ER. As is my want, I protested, but she was serious enough that I was actually considering going. I finally agreed to go just to make husband more comfortable with the situation, but I fully expected that this was a waste of time and hours of my life I'd never get back. By the time we arrive I've accepted that I have pyelonephritis, a kidney infection, but still feel the ER is overkill. After triage and a preemptive blood draw for labs, I was taken to a room. I didn't even have time to change into the stupid, drafty, butt bearing gown provided before my nurse arrived to start a saline drip to treat my dehydration. Cool, pretty standard stuff so far. Several minutes later I was talking with the physician about my signs and symptoms when there's a perfunctory knock at the door and a lab tech entered to hand deliver my test results. Uh oh. This can't be good. I watch her eyes widen as she reads the CBC values, and then she announces, yeah, we're gonna be keeping you overnight. She then orders a second four line, hardcore painkillers, and a massive dose of four antibiotics and leaves me trying to figure out what just happened through a pain and narcotic haze. Well okay, it is around 8 in the evening at this point so overnight observation seems reasonable. I expect a patient transport tech to come fetch me and take me upstairs to a general medical ward. Instead, an RN starts to wheel my bed towards the elevator, which is really weird, nurses usually have better things to do than move patients between wards. At this point, I hadn't been told anything about what was wrong or where I was going, but I start to get somewhat nervous as I'm moved into an intensive care unit. I rationalize this by telling myself that they must be out of general med slash surge beds and so I'm being put into this room as overflow. It's a huge room, and my nurse appears to have only one patient, me. Man, this crap keeps getting weirder. Within minutes, I'm hooked up to every type of monitor I've ever attached to a patient and then some, plus I've got a transmitting cardiac telemetry monitor stuck to me, too. My nurse goes through the endless list of health history, lifestyle, and medication questions, and asks husband to bring my birth control pills from home. What the F? I have pyelonephritis, and this is ridiculous. Uh, is that really necessary? I mean, I'll be home tomorrow. She looks at me with both amusement and pity, and then continues bustling about the room doing important nursing tasks. Yeah, I was wrong. It wasn't the flu. She shattered my last layer of denial by showing me my lab results, and holy effing crap my white count is 28.77. I'm effing dying. A normal white blood cell value is between 3 and 10, and I was so far past that that I was in critical condition. Turns out I was in septic shock in addition to renal failure and E. coli septicemia, and had I waited a few more hours to seek medical help I'd have probably been toast. EFF. I couldn't deny the seriousness of the situation anymore, but I just felt too crappy to even care. 
After a sleepless night and an endless parade of nurses, CNAs, phlebotomists, X-ray slash imaging techs, and a priest, I finally met my attending physician and a whole crew of residents. I'm exhausted, grumpy, and in pain, but apparently I still need to be lectured on how dangerously close to death I'd gotten by waiting to seek help, despite the fact that I had practically zero reason to suspect so. Anyway, afterwards we have a nice, roundtable discussion of my treatment plan, how the antibiotics are working, and about how I'm probably going to be just fine in a couple days. Ha, ah, wrong again. Turns out the massive infusion of fluids and treatments to kickstart my kidneys caused my lungs to fill with fluid, resulting in a condition called ARDS in which, well, you can't freaking breathe. The alveoli, those little sacs in your lungs that do the CO2 slash oxygen exchanging, were effectively flooded, meaning that no matter how much air you're gulping and you simply can't extract the amount of oxygen needed to live without medical intervention. I really, really didn't want to end up intubated with a ventilator breathing for me, and my awesome attending let me try the less dramatic option of diuretics and staying awake to remember to breathe. It sucked. Seriously, the worst, most miserable experience I've been through. But it worked, and on the morning of day 5 in the hospital I got transferred to a general medical ward. It was blessedly quiet, at least until I dozed off and my oxygen sots would drop again and then the monitor would shriek me awake. I was slowly weaned off of supplemental oxygen over the next few days, and eventually got to go home on the condition that I'd sleep with a little extra oxygen at night. The scariest thing about the whole experience was how it snuck up on me so stealthily. Our working theory is that I must have had a completely asymptomatic UTI that progressed to my kidneys, but we'll probably never know for sure. I mean, UTIs aren't generally subtle, and if I'd even suspected I had one I'd have gone to urgent care for a UA and an antibiotic script. I knew what to look for and it still nearly managed to end me. I'm fine now, feeling much better. I'm definitely still tired and lack stamina, but I'd say I'm at about 85%, and it shouldn't be too long until I'm as completely healthy as I'm likely to get. I may have lost some kidney function, so I'll continue to go in for routine blood tests, but we're very optimistic about how the most recent scans looked. I took out, what did the weird kid in your school do that you'll never forget? This was at university, which makes this even weirder. I studied geology so we went on a lot of field trips, one time we went to Spain and I noticed this rather strange girl had a tally chart in the back of her notebook. Now, this girl was odd, she wore all black clothes that were clearly not washed very well. She had bright ginger hair and would hair huge spiky plastic jewelry that was usually bright orange. Like big spiky plastic necklaces or bracelets. She would pick her nose aggressively in class kind of girl. Anyway, I asked some of the other girls if they knew what the tally in her notebook was about, and they said that she was counting the amount of time she had successfully taken a piss while standing up. I don't know about you, but I found this fascinating, I started casually following her one day on our field trip in Spain and sure enough, she would find somewhere she thought was discreet, it wasn't discreet I saw everything, she would take her pants fully off then take a mean piss standing up, the whole time with a demonic smile on her face, crap was scary. Then she puts her pants back on, gets out her notebook to add another tally mark, then saunters off into the Spanish wilderness to do more geology. It was almost as disgusting as it was mesmerizing. So, one day we had a day off to relax and do what we wanted, so everyone agreed we would go to Madrid for the day, so we all get on a big coach and set off. The drive is like two hours. 30 minutes in, she starts mumbling to herself about needing the toilet, everyone around her going quiet as she becomes more agitated. Eventually she jumped up and waddled down the aisle to ask the driver to stop. After a bit of arguing and Spanish shouting from the driver, we pull over. The bus doors open, she walks back up the aisle and gets off using the door halfway down the bus. She takes three steps away from the door and starts digging a hole like an effing badger in heat. Now at this point I think deep down I knew what was about to happen, she's about to take a massive piss right here in front of everyone as the ultimate win slash f you to her classmates she clearly hated, but boy I was wrong. She finished digging her hole, it was quite impressive given how dry the ground was, she turned herself away from the bus, dropped her trousers and took a squat over the hole, what is this, I thought. Maybe she's too shy for a stand up piss, nope. Out comes the most horrific crap from her pasty white butt hole. Like gallons of it, I've never seen so much. The hole she dug, whilst impressive, was not sufficient for the brown mass that spewed forth. She finished, wiped her butt with a small piece of tissue she had in her pocket and got back on the bus, with the same maniacal grin I saw her have with a wild piss. Everyone was silent, our professors just staring at each other, clearly thinking what the f just happened, Jim. Did that girl seriously just unleash a turd tsunami in front of 40 people? The rest of the journey was just silence, I think we were all in shock. We get to Madrid and everyone slowly gets off the bus. A crap girl starts saying again that she needs the toilet and everyone turns to look at her. Her bright orange trousers are soaking wet, like she'd been swimming. One of the other students said Jesus Christ, what the hell happened? And casually as anything, she turns to him and says the bus ride was too long, I pissed myself a few times comma at this point I'm losing my mind, what the f lady? You stopped the bus so you could decimate the landscape, you couldn't have pissed then? You might as well have, I mean everyone saw your massive dump I don't think a quick piss would have bothered anyone. Seriously. Anyway, two girls took pity and carted her off to a public toilet. The rest of us went to a few museums and had a great day but it was hard to enjoy to be quite honest. 
Madrid's Natural History Museum didn't have the same jovial atmosphere after watching a grown woman crap and piss herself. Bartender. Women who gave the creep a chance, how did it go? There was a guy that came into my work, restaurant, a few times a week for lunch. He did this for a little over a month so he became a regular. He had asked me out every time I brought his bill. He always asked in a light-hearted way and never seemed upset or anything when I turned him down. I assumed that after the first few questions, he may have thought of it as more of an inside joke at that point. Like he was just asking now to make light of the previous rejections and to make it less awkward or something. He always gave me weird vibes but seemed nice enough so I thought I might have just been making assumptions because of his appearance and wasn't being fair. One time that he asked, I decided randomly to agree and give him a shot. Why not I thought. He was always super kind and I had gotten rather used to the awkwardness I felt being around him. He seemed so excited and I asked him to leave his number on the receipt and I would call slash text him when I wasn't busy to set something up. So it wasn't really much of a joke to keep asking me out, I mostly figured that though tbh. A few days later I hadn't texted him yet to set anything up or even give him my number and I get a text only a few minutes after walking into my house after I got home from work. It said, hey, it's from. I know it's a long shot but I'm free tonight and bored, wanna hang out? If you're free that is. I asked him how he got my number. He said I gave it to him the night I agreed. I absolutely know I didn't. I got really creeped out but decided not to confront him about it and just play like I'm a ditz and believe that I must have done that, I just didn't remember because it was busy. I told him that I wasn't free to hang out that night, that I was going to be working later to help cover a shift and then would be pretty pooped by the time I was off, I only ever saw him come in for lunch not ever dinner shifts. A few minutes passed before he responded. He said, why are you lying to me? I just responded with what? Lol. He said, I know you are home. If you didn't want to hang out tonight you could have just said so. Alarm bells rang in my head. I thought, there's no way he's outside my house. He is just trying to call my bluff. Creepy but not a full-blown stalker. But I felt exposed. I felt the crawling on my skin that only burns into you when someone is staring at you. The vulnerable pulses that are felt only by prey. I looked out through the blinds of my bedroom and he was parked right outside my house. I could see his face lit up by the phone screen. He was so close. I texted him and said, ahaha you caught me. How did you know I was bluffing? I'm sorry. I do want to hang out soon. I'm just not feeling up to it tonight. And called 911. The police showed up and went up to his car and talked to him for a bit. He drove away a few minutes later and then the officers came to my door. They told me that they acted like a random neighbor complaining about a strange car. They didn't implicate anyone but made it seem like it was an older person, so probably not me. They took his plate information but asked him politely to move so he didn't upset anyone in the neighborhood and he complied. I went to my friend's house that night and filed a restraining order the next morning. I later found out that he most likely got my number from the shift sheet behind the hostess counter, because several co-workers had seen him, at different times, snooping back there and kindly stopped him. He, I guess, grabbed a roll of silverware claiming that the server hadn't left him any and he didn't want to bother anyone because he knew they were busy so just grabbed it himself. This stopped anyone from suspecting him of anything odd. And that his car had been parked at my house almost every night, neighbor's security camera. I don't know how he got my address but I assume he must have followed me. He must have been full on stalking me for a while. He did come into my work a day or two later for lunch acting like everything was normal. I immediately went and got my manager and she informed him that he had a restraining order against him preventing him from eating there because he would be in violation of it. I had already changed my phone number so I don't know if he tried to text me and I didn't sleep at my house for weeks, but I never saw him again after that. And I often find myself thinking back to that time and wondering how much more he did and for how long that I don't know about. Like, maybe he stalked me long before he started coming into the restaurant, and only started coming in there because he felt more brave than before to interact with me. How much of my private moments throughout my life were actually not private. Also, I have never once stopped feeling scared that he might have still stalked me and knows where I am even now, but is keeping himself hidden. I doubt it, but the fear is still there. I have never felt comfortable being alone. Ever. Most of this would have still probably happened even if I didn't agree to give him a chance. But if he hadn't slipped up about having my phone number when he shouldn't, I would have gone out somewhere with him and who knows how badly that could have ended. What is the worst first date you have ever been on? More like a first date that never wanted to end so this might be long. I had just moved to a different state and decided to try out the online dating scene. This was before the days of Tinder and Match.com was one of the only options. I matched with a guy that seemed to be pretty genuine, decent looking, and wasn't horrible in phone slash text conversation. We decided to meet at a restaurant to grab appetizers and drinks. When we got there, the conversation seemed great. He even looked like his picture. Shortly after getting there, we both decided to order dinner because we were both hungry and had a rough day at work. He offered to pay. Shortly after ordering, he grabs my hand as it was resting on the table next to my drink. He proceeds to hold it and seems to have no desire to let it go. Sadly, he still seemed very genuine. He then switches our conversation from work and friends to how he is baby fever. We're both in our young 20s mind you, he's still holding my hand. No amount of tugging will give him the message and at this point I'm beyond creeped out to the point of scared. I don't believe I said a word to him after he uttered the words baby fever. Food comes. 
Thank heavens. I can finally get my hand back. No. Think again. He wants to hold hands and eat at the same time. Of course me being a young 20 something, I ordered a salad which is totally doable with only one hand. Rookie mistake. The waiter comes over and can obviously see my desperation. I'm fairly certain I'm sweating at this point, my hand feels gross, and I'm awkwardly looking around for an exit strategy. I can't even grab my drink without making a bigger effort, then the glorious moment happens. The waiter accidentally spills my wine on my date. My hand is finally free. My date rushes off to the bathroom to clean up. He seems overly understanding after having an entire glass of red wine dumped on him. The waiter apologizes then looks me dead in the eye and says I got you, go now. I'll take care of it. I immediately got up, said, thank you, and got out so fast I almost forgot my coat. Waiter chased me down to give it to me, at this point, I have no clue what happened after I left and I didn't care. I get a text later from my date that says how he hopes everything is okay. Ignore and block. A day or so later, I get a message from a coworker that someone is waiting in the hallway for me. Where I work, you can't get into the building without being an employee, I think nothing of it and walk out to see who it is. It's common to wait there as our office is only open for the IT nerds. I open the door, turn to see who's there, and yelp. Excited to see me? And I'm effed. I must have had the biggest look of disgust and terror mixed with gas on my face. Mr. Creepy Handholder Online Dating Sucks First Date Works at my company. He asks how my grandma is doing, I play along assuming that the waiter said something about her. He reaches out to grab my hand and I yell out I'm infertile. I had no clue where that came from nor did I have any idea if I was, he looked at me strangely without saying a word and I used the awkward distraction to go back into my office. I got a message from him later that day on my work chat asking if I'd be interested in fertility treatments. I noped right out of that conversation and went directly to security. I never heard or saw him again. What happened at a wedding that let you know the marriage would fail? My cousin Jan's wedding was basically just a preamble to an elaborate dance of divorce that we all knew was coming from the moment the engagement began. For context, this took place 15 years ago in the backwoods of NC. My family is just a generation or two removed from snake handling in church, so some of the wackiness is the product of upwardly mobile inbreeding, and redneck gumption. Just a few things that come to mind, her fiancé proposed to her over the corpse of her father. He was over with the family watching TV when Jan's dad collapsed on the floor. He died before emergency services arrived. Her boyfriend grabbed her hands as she was sitting next to her father's body, pulled her up to her feet, and then asked her to marry him. He later said that he didn't want her to get away. The fiancé then disappeared for a month a week after the funeral. Nobody knew where to reach him. The bride's white trash mother told Jan that she had to get married within four months because she, the mother, my aunt, planned to move to another state with her new boyfriend to avoid bill collectors. When Jan's fiancé showed back up, he was cagey and weird. Eventually, it came out that he'd been living with his ex-girlfriend because she insisted that he had to give her a month of his life, or she'd take him to court for child support that he was supposed to be paying on their infant son, but had never paid. Throughout all of this, Jan continued to insist that she wanted to marry him. My mother and I did most of the wedding prep and arrangements. Jan's mom, despite insisting on the four-month timeline to help pay for the wedding before her move, never contributed a dime, and we were both pretty convinced that the wedding was going to be cancelled at any moment. But, the day arrived, and so did the principal players. At the wedding itself, the groom walked around drinking PBR out of a massive travel thermos with a novelty straw, and told everyone who would listen that Jan was a good starter wife. Jan threw several tantrums about stupid crap, including one in which she accused the groom of stealing her drink. He told her she was a dumb whore, but it all worked out because then she found her drink. The groom pulled the ring off of Jan's finger during the reception and swallowed it as a joke. The groom picked a fight with his father because his dad had asked the ex-girlfriend to stay at home, and the groom had really wanted her to be there. Jan was in the dark about this invitation until the fight broke out. Shocking precisely nobody, except possibly Jan herself, they eventually did divorce. Eating the ring caused the groom some discomfort, so they had to cancel their honeymoon to the mountains so that he could go to the ER and get hospital-grade laxatives. They lost money on the cancellation and the ER visit, which they really didn't have to lose. That resulted in some immediate debt problems, and they lost the trailer they'd planned to rent when they couldn't come up with a deposit. That resulted in both of them moving into the groom's parents' home, into his old bedroom. Things went downhill from there. The groom's ex-girlfriend popped back up less than three months after the wedding, heavily pregnant with his second child. She went after him for another shared month, but Jan wasn't cool with it. The ex ended up taking him to court for child support. Jan got a second job to make ends meet while resigning herself to living with her in-laws for a while longer. One day, after he dropped her off at work, the groom sold Jan's car. He then disappeared for several more weeks. She lost both jobs, and shortly thereafter realized she was pregnant. The groom accused her of cheating because he thought he couldn't have more than two children in a lifetime, and his ex-girlfriend had already filled the quota. As I understand it, this is what ultimately caused the rift in their relationship. My roommate left her feces smeared all over the bathroom walls and poisoned me. I lived with an awful, now ex, roommate. This happened back in 2020. I moved out of a living situation where a caregiver was allowing a small dog to attack my cat. I moved out fast for her safety, unknowingly into an even worse situation. 
In my state the government helps home homeless people through a program, and in comes Sherry, fake name for privacy's sake. Sherry is an alcoholic with extreme IBS and as you probably guessed, came off the streets. It was my first time moving out on my own. I noticed pretty early on that Sherry was a slob, but this was to be expected as she didn't really have experience cleaning a home. The issue started when I woke up late at night and used the bathroom, when I sat down and felt the floor and seat was wet. I turned the lights on and, to my horror, it was like a brown slaughter scene. Human feces spread on the toilet seat, the floor, the walls next to the toilet, it was like a diarrhea bomb went off. I didn't even know that was possible. I informed my landlord, who only believed me with picture evidence, which should have been a huge red flag at the time, but I was still a teenager. I confronted her the next day and she explained that she has ibs, that she can't help it, I said I understand you have a condition, but if you make a mess it has to be cleaned. She mopped the floor, and I had to take her back into the bathroom and instruct her to clean the walls and the toilet seat where the stains remained. I thought all was well, fast forward two weeks. Both of us and my cat are experiencing dry throat, intense stomach aches, migraines, and dizziness. I noticed that when I walked on the bathroom floor my feet were burning. I asked Sherry if she also felt sick, she said yes and didn't know why. It clicked a day later. I asked what she cleaned the bathroom floor with. She says, bleach, I said, how much water did you dilute it with? Silence. I asked again and she said I just used bleach, I said straight bleach? She started yelling and I shut myself in my room, furious. I re-mopped the floor twice before the symptoms disappeared. My cat was living in my one bedroom at the time and so she had the most exposure, unable to go anywhere that could get away from the scent of bleach fuming into my room from under the door. This incident made me incredibly angry with Sherry but I let it go, since she was brought into the house using a government program, it was hard to kick her out for the landlord. It sucked because she'd spend all her money drinking herself stupid, which made her IBS that much worse. Every incident was documented and shared with him. It is important to know he gave us access to the upstairs bathroom if we needed it. Cut to a few months later, I'm cleaning the kitchen and mopping. I wear headphones while I clean to make it easier to focus, and I at this point have kept my room locked since I found Sherry opening my door without knocking and suspected she was snooping through my stuff. The apartment has a kitchen door identical to and right next to my bedroom door. I lock my door and get to mopping. Suddenly the kitchen door is being banged on and Sherry is screaming. Well, I had unknowingly locked the kitchen door instead of my own. She was howling, banging, and threatening to end me, along with calling me slurs I won't repeat. I apologized through the door but was honestly scared she'd attack me outright. I waited for her to walk away, unlock the door, and lock myself in my room. I call the landlord, tell him what's happening and he says that she's just kidding, she won't do anything she's just an old woman. I tell him she's threatening to end me and he brushes me off. It isn't until she calls him and threatens to end me to him that he even comes over to see what's going on. Suddenly the banging continues, and I mean walls are shaking she's hitting the door so hard. I recorded this and said I just unlocked the door. She screams yay and I locked it back so landlord could see what you did, stupid B. You made me crap myself. Landlord gets there and doesn't believe me until I make him watch the video. He tells her she just could have gone upstairs. I tell him he needs to believe me when I say something is going on that serious, I mean it. She ends up finally getting kicked out, and someone even worse moved in before I get the hell out of there. What's the dumbest thing you've done out of pure horniness? Spoke to a guy online. He was older and kept mentioning fur. I thought that meant that he was identified as a bear. He kept saying he loved fur, and all things fur. I was like, okay, he must be into hairy guys and bears and crap like that. Being moderately hairy myself, I thought I could satisfy his need for fur. Well, upon arrival at his house, he greeted me in an ankle-length fur coat, chinchilla. At this point I realized he meant actual fur, and fur items. I went in and he had like, an entire room full of fur coats, most of them on the floor all spread out for us to lie on. I hooked up with him for a bit, he loved to rub the fur coat on his willy and crap. Whatever, it was very humdrum. Those boomers are so easy to get off since they went through puberty without internet adult flimps and the slightest breeze across their willies gets them hard. Anyway, on my way out the door he asked if I liked fur. I said I loved fur coats. Then he offered me one, a floor-length arctic fox. I of course declined, I did not have a spare 5k to give him, nor did I want to owe him for anything. I told him flat out that I did not plan on continuing this, that this was just a hookup, and that I would essentially never see him again, let alone arrange for some form of payment. I wasn't about to whore myself out, especially for a, ladies, fur coat from the 80s. Shoulders looking like a mixture of a quarterback and Alexis Morel Carrington Colby Dexter Rowan. He insisted that he really wanted me to have it and that I would never have to owe him for this and that we would never even have to meet again. I took the coat, and this is where I effed up. Days later he texts me, when will we meet again? I ignored him for a while. Days go by, I get another, more insistent, text. When are we meeting up again, I gave you that fur coat, you need to see me now. I went through the hole I told you I had no intentions of seeing you again and you insisted I take this coat after I rejected it like three times and also you insisted I would owe you nothing and that I take the coat. He said that I needed to see him again to return the coat or that he wanted me to give him a pair of my dirty underwear. I was floored, 
He knew I had no intention of ever seeing him again, no means of paying for a coat like this, and that I was above whoring myself out, let alone for a measly fur coat. I reminded him of this. I said that I did not feel safe meeting him in person to give him this coat any longer since he was now attempting to manipulate me and coerce me back into an intimate circumstance with him. He then said that he would call the police on me, I reminded him that he gave me the coat, insisted that I take it, and insisted that I would owe him nothing for it. He then said that if I did not return the coat or give him my dirty underwear, he would tell everyone I was gay, I laughed and informed him that he was free to do that because A, everyone knows I'm gay as hell, and B, I don't live a cowardly life in the closet, and therefore don't care. I told him I did not appreciate him lying to me, and then trying to blackmail me into having intercourse with him, giving the coat back, or giving him a pair of my dirty underwear like some back page slag. He got frustrated, thinking that these scare tactics and blackmailing would induce me into taking him seriously and suddenly believing him to be honest and true to his already broken words. Then he brought out the big guns, he said that if I did not meet him to hook up, give him a pair of my dirty underwear, and give him back the coat, he would tell his wife all about it. I did not know he was married, or masquerading as a straight man. He was one of those guys, the straight closet guy who wants all the benefits of sleeping with men, but none of the responsibility or social stigma. A effing scared coward. I said to him, so let me get this straight, you want me to hook up with you again, after you said I wouldn't have to, you want me to give you back the coat you insisted I'd take against my wishes, and you want me to give you my dirty underwear, and if I don't comply, you're going to tell your wife on me? A wife that you conveniently failed to even mention before? I laughed, and he got really angry. It was then I realized he gave me the coat thinking that he could use this, and his threats, against me to coerce me into having intercourse with him and all his fur coats again. I informed him that I was aware of this. He hung up on me. What story do you have that disproves the worst she can say is no. In high school, I once asked a girl out that I didn't think I had any chance with. I figured hey, the worst she could say is no, assumed she would probably say no, and planned on using the experience as a comfort when trying to ask someone out that I thought I had a chance with. In other words, when trying to work up the courage to ask someone out in the future, I could think back to this moment, realize from this experience that being told no wasn't so bad, and go for it. I asked her out, she said she was going out with someone else, and that was that. Easy and painless. And then she started telling people that I demanded that she switch from her current partner to me, and that she had to shout at me to get me to leave her alone. Someone else started a rumor that, after I got rejected, I ran into the bathroom and cried. Someone else came up with a short little theme song about how I got rejected. Everyone found it catchy, including people I thought were my friends, so people would sing it at me everywhere. Random people in the hallways would see me and start singing it at me. I couldn't escape it until people finally lost interest several months, maybe even a year? I don't remember exactly, later. I was horribly humiliated and depressed and sad and so on for all that time, but I figured it was just a fluke. Then, in the fall semester in college, a female friend promised to me that she would get me laid by the end of the spring semester. I'd overheard her talking to people about it, wondering whether it would be better to pair me with another virgin or with someone experienced, for example, so even though months passed with no actual progress, I assumed things were happening behind the scenes. On the last day of the spring semester, there was a big party at her place, so I texted her earlier in the day so if today's the last day of the semester, does that mean I'm getting laid? I was thinking the worst she could say was no, as in haha, no, that was all a joke or something to that effect. No harm in bringing it up, right? I wouldn't have been upset if that was what happened. I don't remember her response exactly, but I think she took it as a joke and replied non-seriously with a hell yeah. Or something along those lines. Halfway through the party that night, she gets everyone's attention and announces that she got the best text ever today. I assumed it wasn't my text, because that wouldn't make sense, so I was looking forward to hearing what she had to say. She then proceeded to, in a mockingly stupid voice, read my text to everyone with absolutely no context, and then point to me. Everyone effing lost it with laughter. I heard one guy later say to a girl next to him, don't get too intoxicated, or you might end up sleeping with him. While motioning to me. They both laughed pretty hard about that one. I was already intoxicated at that point, so I couldn't drive home, so I was trapped. I spent a lot of time silently crying to myself in the bathroom. I was tempted to try to drive home anyway, because I really didn't care what happened to me at that point, but the thought that I might end up hurting someone else stopped me. The events of that night replayed in my head almost every day for the entire summer. I felt like I was worthless as a person, completely undesirable romantically and intimately. I felt like I was just, uselessly broken, unrepairable, that I was a misfit that didn't belong in this world. What's your worst rejection story? Senior year of high school, this girl I had met through a mutual friend and I suddenly had multiple random encounters. A few weeks go by, and we really start to hit it off. We spend every day together, I call and talk to her on the phone, we even end up going out to dinner, not an official date. I'm totally smitten by this girl and things are moving along perfectly. Our prom was coming up and I decided to ask her. Now, the place I lived in had rather elaborate methods of asking people to prom slash homecoming type dances, so my buddy and I hatched a plan to ask this girl out by messing with her room and putting some clever personalized stuff around. Seriously, this is normal, I call her mom to get permission to do all this, and I start to get really excited when she agrees. 
That night I got a phone call from the girl that basically went like this. Hey, so I know I'm not supposed to know this, but I heard you were planning on asking me to prom, and I think that would be a bad idea, so, normally this is where the story would end. This one doesn't do that. After putting my shattered pride back together, I move on with my life. I graduate, leave town and generally proceed to think about the crappy events as little as possible, but it always stings a little when I think about her. About a year after this whole incident, I got a random phone call from this girl. We strike back up our old friendship, and things move along quite nicely. In the course of getting to know one another again, she tells me that the prom thing wasn't my fault. Turns out she'd just gotten out of a pretty rough relationship and wasn't ready to start something new and didn't want to hurt me. I get really excited about this. As we continue to talk every day again, I realize that I'm totally into this girl for the second time. As luck would have it, I also made some plans that meant moving back to town a few months down the road. Well, Christmas rolls around and I make a trip back to visit family and friends. When I get into town, I call her and make plans to take her out on a real first date. We end up spending the majority of the day together, something like 12 hours, and everything goes perfectly. The night ends and I couldn't be happier. We made plans to get together later that week at a friend's house. When she shows up to our friend's house, she almost immediately hides out in her car to take a phone call, for about 3 hours. In my heart, I know this is bad news for me. When she finally comes in, she purposefully sits across the room from me even though I try to get her to be near me. From that point on we stop talking to one another every day and move down to about once every few weeks. I find out months later, through Facebook, that she's dating someone else. Her ex-boyfriend. The one who called her while she was at our friend's house to profess his love and apologize for whatever wrong things he did. Two days after what up to that point had been the most perfect date of my life. We eventually became friends again, and we both got married. Who is the worst kid, under 15, you ever met? Used to work at a summer camp where we would have kids from every demographic and socioeconomic group, kids on scholarship who barely made it all the way to the super rich. All in all the kids were good with a few exceptions, one of which I will call John. Now John was about 13 when I worked with him and clearly had some emotional issues that were not being addressed by his super wealthy parents who instead would ship him off to summer camps all over the country. Being that he was a teen he went into our teen camp which was more autonomous but still relatively structured. To get to the campsite you had to cross a bridge that was over a narrow but very deep creek, relevance will come up. One day as I am sitting in my office I get a text from a counselor at the teen camp who told me to get over there as soon as possible so naturally I get up and sprint there. I show up and John is sitting at a picnic table with three other kids and two very upset looking counselors. As I approach John starts yelling that whatever they say is a lie and they hate him. I pull the lead counselor aside and he tells me that they caught John throwing a brick from the campsite on Duck and her chicks as they were peacefully swimming down the creek. Unfortunately John hit the mother but didn't enter so now there was this poor duck thrashing around in front of her chicks on the shore of the creek comma dot all of this was about 40 feet from another cabin group of young girls. We called an animal rehab specialist who came out and safely got all the chicks but the mother died shortly afterwards. He also punished a poor little girl and broke her glasses. Needless to say the head camp director is pissed and wants him to leave immediately, we had a behavioral provision in the camp rules that said if children became too hard to work with they would be sent home. Called his parents who did not seem alarmed with the behavior and said they were leaving for a cruise the next day. Camp director reminds them of the provision and how their son was no longer welcome in camp. Again parents don't seem alarmed and finally send a friend to get the kid. I saw on Facebook that John is currently studying medicine which scares the absolute life out of me. When was someone's assumption about you terribly wrong? I was once assumed as a perdo, hear me out. I had taken my nephew to the park, my sister and Bill were in town for a few days and they were going out for dinner just the two of them, I took my little three-year-old nephew to the park. It was just us, we were running around having a good time, pushing him on the swings, finding cool rocks, etc. A lady and her big dog had walked over to me at one point and asked, oh your son is so cute. I responded with, thanks, but it's not my son. She then, without time to explain, flipped a switch, tried to get between me and my nephew while taking pictures of me on her phone. I was telling her to get the hell away from us, making my nephew cry because he didn't know what was going on. She called the police and she's screaming at the top of her lungs for me to stay back or she'll defend herself while trying to pick up my nephew. I suddenly stopped caring if she thought I was a perdo or not, she had her hands on my nephew and that wasn't going to fly with me. I picked him up and we started speed walking back to my car, big mistake. She started telling the cops my license plate number, make slash model of my car, saying I was kidnapping him. I was so mad I was seeing red. I sat in the car because I thought it would be best if at that point I waited for the police. I had him buckled into his car seat with the engine running just in park, idling. She's slamming her hands on my windshield trying to get other people to come help her, but a few people just come and stand behind my car so I can't leave. Police show up. Guns drawn, telling me to exit the vehicle. I get out, I have tears in my eyes at this point because I'm so mad slash confused. I got handcuffed, I was asked a million questions until they finally understood that this woman didn't know either of us. I finally got to tell my side of the story which consisted of, I took my nephew to the park, this lady asked if I was the father, I said no, she didn't listen to a word I said after that and tried to take her from me. The lady is looking super embarrassed once I'm done telling the story. 
My nephew is asked to come up in my arms because he's scared. I picked him up and he cuddled right in. The cops asked the kid if I was his uncle and he just nodded yes silently. The woman starts this sob story about how she was abducted as a child and thought she was doing the right thing. I didn't care at that point, I was so mad at her. We leave, all laugh about it at dinner, life went on, but f, it had got to be the worst time of my life.